Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, one of my jobs at the museum is to manage our ongoing oral history project. And this is a dynamic and ongoing initiative that we've been doing for 25 years. And we capture stories, capture memories of President Kennedy and the day of the assassination and the history and culture of the time period. We believe that everyone has a story to share. So if any of you have memories of that time period and would like to be part of this tapestry of history that we're creating at the museum, you can contact us via our website, jfk.org. We can do a videotaped interview with you here at the museum. Or if you're visiting from out of town, we can certainly arrange to record a telephone interview and you can be part of this collection, which is accessed uh, by students, teachers, researchers, and historians from around the world. In uh, recording these oral histories, every so often a remarkable storyteller emerges. We like to invite those folks back to the museum to do a program with us. That's what living history is all about, and today is no exception. Walt Coughlin was a United States Secret Service agent from 1961 to 1977. During that time, he served on the details for President Kennedy, President Johnson and Vice President Humphrey. And beginning in 1973, he was the agent in charge of the Dallas office of the United States Secret Service. So a lot of ground to cover today. I've already got a stack of questions in my pocket from the audience, and I'll encourage you to submit other questions as we move along today. But with that, please join me in welcoming Walt Coughlin to tell his story. Well, Walt, let's start at the beginning. How did you come to be with the Secret Service? Looking for a job. <laughs> Not really. When I got out of college, uh, I was on a football scholarship in college, and um, then all of us in those days had to uh, um, uh, serve time in the military. I was in the military. I, I, I met a man who was... Uh, Thinking, talking about the Secret Service, which I was not familiar with, quite frankly. I thought it was part of the FBI or CIA or something. But anyway, I had an interest in it, and uh, when I got out of the Army, I came back and uh, took the test and was fortunate enough to pass it, and uh, the rest is history. I loved every minute of it. Now, before you were assigned to the presidential detail in 1962, you were in West Virginia, then you were in New York. Since most of us probably think of the Secret Service as the guys that protect the president, <coughs> What did you do before you got on the White House detail? The Secret Service is the oldest law enforcement agency in government started in 1865. And they started during the Lincoln administration to suppress the counterfeiting of currency during the Civil War. So it was under the Treasury Department. And then over the years, they picked up other jurisdictions, like now they have credit card fraud in conjunction with the FBI. And they have uh, uh, the counterfeit of uh, currency, forgery of government checks and bonds. Any obligation to the Treasury Department comes underneath the jurisdiction of the Secret Service. Uh, that's what we did in West Virginia, because uh, it was such, at those days it was such a poverty state. There were many people getting government checks, and uh, uh, being a rural area, a lot were missing from the mailbox when you went to pick them up. So that was basically what I did in West Virginia. And I get to New York, and the capacity of the crime in New York compared to West Virginia was just unbelievable to me. I was in shock. I mean. They throw cases in a wastebasket in New York that we tried. We tried in a courtroom in New York, in uh, West Virginia. But anyway, everything I did in New York was 99% of it was counterfeiting. And I found it very interesting because, thank goodness, I was kind of a city boy who understood the streets. And I grew up in the streets of Washington, D.C. I spent some time in an orphanage and I uh, grew up on a salt and pepper playground. And uh, so I, I knew how to, uh, to work the streets. And New York was very interesting to me, but I really wanted to get to the White House because it gave me an it would give me an opportunity to do things like travel that I had never been able to do. And uh, eventually, I was uh, accepted at the White House. And that was in June of '62. And it's my understanding that the White House detail is the best of the best. So certainly, you qualified. Well, I we like to think that uh, when you go there, you get a 30-day temporary assignment. And I happened to get mine out of New York City. And when you go in there for a 30-day assignment, you're working a shift work with the guys that are assigned there now. And at those time, it was, in, in my time, it was all men. Now there are a lot of ladies. But uh, what you would think would be the supervisors are taking a look at you. Well, the fact is it's the guys you're working with. And uh, if, if they don't want you, you're not getting on there. And I remember, I can tell you a quick story. Uh, we had a young man when I was with Humphrey, came in from New York, and he had all the answers the day he got there. Uh, and uh, we were about ready to leave on a two-week trip around the world with the vice president. As we're taking off from Andrews Air Force Base, we said, hey, Roy, is that your suitcase out there in the tarmac? I mean, yeah, we forgot to load it. 
he quit when he got back because we knew that he wasn't the type of guy that, uh, that would uh, work with us and uh, he wasn't a team player at all. And so we, just, he, he, we got rid of him, basically. <laughs> Hazing in the Secret Service, that's wonderful. Uh, we're looking at a picture of, uh, of you with President Kennedy and at the time Vice President Johnson. I'm going I'm to circle you right there so you can see. We're going to look at quite a few pictures of, of Walt with the President today. Uh, being so close to the President, and of course this is a, an important transition from Dwight Eisenhower, the oldest President in American history, to John F. Kennedy, the youngest ever elected. What was Kennedy like in public versus in private? Give us a sense of his personality. Well, I, let me start with Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a very calm man. He was a general first, last, and always. And everyone else was at best a sergeant. Most of them were privates. But he was nice. Kennedy came in office, and he was just a joy to be with. Uh, it was the days of Camelot, uh, the young president, and everyone seemed to love him. He was nice to us. Uh, he was very cooperative. Uh, the young family, Jackie was nice. The staff was nice. They were all bright. They were all young. And uh, it was a joy to be with President Kennedy. Uh, now, there was a lot of things going on uh, at the time uh, that we kind of ignored it originally, like uh, Khrushchev shot off uh, a rocket to the moon. Uh, and then you had the Berlin Wall going up. There were dark clouds rising all over the place. Uh, Cuba fell to Castro. So things were not good, really, but they appeared to be good uh, during the early days of Camelot. Now, here's another picture, and you are over here in the corner. I'm Where's the guy you? with hair. In those <laughs> you haven't changed a bit. It's only been yeah. 50 years. Now, was Kennedy an easy president to protect? Not really. It, and it had nothing to do with him. Uh, he was very willing to go along with us, but... The crowds were so overzealous of him. They just, they wanted to touch him. They loved him. Uh, he was charismatic. Uh, so from that standpoint, we had a, we had a lot of trouble with, uh, with protecting him. Uh, they, no matter how many ropes you put up, somebody came over the rope. And uh, sometimes you had to get pretty forceful with him. But uh, no, he, he was difficult to protect because the public wanted to be near him. They wanted to touch him. Uh, and, and it wasn't his fault. And at the same time, there were those who really disliked Kennedy, either because of his Catholicism or because of his politics. Oh, uh, it, uh, in those days, being Catholic was not the most popular thing in the South, and maybe other places too, but particularly in the South. And that was one of the main reasons, I feel, that he had to take Lyndon Johnson as vice president uh, to, to somehow help him carry the South. The Catholicism factor plus... Uh, they just didn't, a lot of people just didn't like him because of his wealth or whatever it was. And uh, it was kind of a, a love-hate relationship with the population, not as bad as it is today with the current operation going on. But in those days, a lot of people just didn't like him, but for the most part, they loved him. There was a, a respect in, in those days for the office of the president, if not the man himself? That's true. That's true. Um, and, and when they trained us, when we went to the White House, we went through special training, and they, they told us that, you know, you're, not, you're assigned to the president, but you're working for the office of the president. Whoever's in that office is your responsibility. It's not, we don't care whether you like him or not. That has nothing to do with it. You have a job to do to try to keep that man alive and keep him from getting embarrassed also. But, uh, no, we, we, we were trained to acknowledge the fact that we work for the office of the president, not the person. We're looking at a, another picture here. That's uh, Mr. Coghlan on the far right next to the uh, British policeman. This is, of course, taken in the United Kingdom. Uh, what about the news media? Of course, Kennedy had uh, press conferences, and the media followed him everywhere he went. Was there a good relationship between the Secret Service and the press? In those days, it was excellent. It was excellent. Uh, we were all friends. I knew them all by name, and they knew us. Uh, that's different today, by the way. But when we were there, they helped us all the time. Uh, and one of the biggest shocks I had when, when that guy shot President Reagan was that he was standing in the press area and no one in the press told the Secret Service he was there. That would never have happened when I was there. They, they helped us and we helped them. Uh, there were times when they had a locked door or something or were told to go on a certain door. We, we made sure they got in. Uh, 
But all that has changed. I don't know the reason, but it happened after the assassination. Under the Johnson administration, uh, it became less and less friendly to us. They did. And I think we became more and more suspect of them. So uh, it's not any better today either, because uh, I know that there's no love lost between the Secret Service and uh, probably any law enforcement agency in government. Uh, but uh, it's changed, and it's not for the better. Did President Kennedy ever make your job harder by uh, putting himself into dangerous situations or telling you to stand down or anything like that? The only time I've ever heard him or, or know of him telling people to get off the back of the car was here in Dallas. And it just got so crowded, I think he was more concerned about somebody getting hurt because the crowds were just in, into the car. He was hard to protect, but he was, and you have to remember, the politician's job is to get reelected and to be with the people. So you're really talking about oil and water. We're, our job is trying to keep, we'd love to keep him in a box, but you're not going to do that. So he has to be exposed to the public. So you have to be able to judge where you are, be able to read the, the way the people are acting. And it's kind of interesting. If you ever, I always compare it to the Kilgore Rangerettes. Like we used to walk out of mass with him at Hyannisport and there would be people there waiting to see him. And there was a camera, a wave, a smile. So the guy who stood there just staring at him stuck out like the gal in the Kilgore Rangerette that missed the kick down the end of the line. So what you do, just go to stand in front of that person. Nine times out of ten, he was just kind of a strange person, but you never knew. But, uh, uh, you, but my point is that when you see everyone smiling in this room as you're scanning the room, and then you see some guy in here wearing a trench coat, you, you know, you might want to go check him out. Have you scanned this crowd? There's a trench coat guy back there I want to talk to. <laughs> Now, we're going to take a look at another picture. This is from Berlin, and you were with the president in Berlin in June of 1963, and I understand that that was one of your favorite trips with the president. Well, I was uh, selected as one of four other people to do the advance. We were there two weeks preparing for this trip, and it was a 34-mile motorcade along the entire Berlin Wall. And it was, it was just a great experience for me. Uh, the German uh, uh, police are excellent. You can see this parade picture. Uh, look how far back they keep the people. You could never get that in the United States. It's just the mentality of the Germans. They're easy to work with. Uh, I don't know what would have happened if somebody would have ran up to the car. They probably would have shot them. I don't know. But that's kind of, that was kind of the mentality that we were working with, and they were good. Uh, in fact, I've always said that one of the best police forces I've ever worked with was here in Berlin. They're just excellent. And they take no nonsense, and they give no quarter. But uh, it was a very difficult stop. Tremendous crowds, million people in the plots where he spoke. And uh, he, uh, they loved him. They loved him. And I understand your next program is going to be a gal who heard him as a young child. So uh, he, he did a wonderful job. It was a great two weeks for me. And uh, I have fond memories of that trip. Now, looking at a picture like this in 2014, seeing the president standing up in an open car surrounded by people, uh, something like this would never happen today. The same thing in Dallas with the open motorcade through downtown. Was there just a, a, a mentality that, that someone wouldn't take a shot at the president, or what was the thinking? Well, that's the same car, by the way, that he was killed in. Um, well, you try to cut down the angles. The two guys there on the back, but standing up is not a safe thing. Now, you have to remember, this country, you have to go back. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Garfield in 1896, McKinley in 1901. They tried to kill Truman in 1948. It's not like this is new to this country. You know, and then the assassination of, of, uh, of Kennedy. They tried Ford, tried to kill him twice and within a month. And then you had Reagan. You know, it's just, it's not new to this country. In fact, what scares me about this gentleman that's in there now is it's been so long, the time frame is there, and there's a lot of people that aren't particularly like, they don't particularly like him. Uh, the thing... And from the, from the standpoint of the Secret Service getting investigative information, uh, they, they rely on it from other agencies and threats come in or, or somebody wrote a letter. What they're concerned about with this particular president is some wacko plan, plan pool and said, I'll give you 50 bucks if you shoot him, and no one ever knows about it. And that's the kind of thing that the Secret Service is concerned about today. Uh, but I hope to God it never happens again because it, just was, it was tragic for the nation. Uh, and they lost a guy they really loved. 
And of course, technology was different in 1963. Um, you didn't have a, a database on your phone that you could refer to. You had index cards. Tell us about that. Well, we didn't have radios. There were radios in the cars, but we didn't have radios personally. And we used to give hand signals, you know, look at that guy over there. You know? And uh, for the, what we would do as an advance agent, when, when they arrived at your stop, we would hand them the plans for the day on, on a, a five-by-seven card. And uh, that to us was modern, that was modern times. You have to remember that in those, when Kennedy was assassinated, there are probably more Secret Service agents today assigned to President Obama than were in the Secret Service in 1963. I think we had about 350 agents in the Secret Service in 1953. There's probably more than that assigned to the White House today. Plus they have armored cars, they have, and it took a tragedy to bring all that about. Because we used to ask for more agents, and you know, when I came in there were six of us in one class, you know. And I don't know if there's a, a friend of mine, I'm the Bureau, they probably have 50 guys in their class in those days. And um, we just weren't able to, through the Treasury, they weren't security conscious. Uh, and it took a long time to, uh, to get them to understand. Because I was in the car, I had two tragedies happening when I was with Vice President Humphrey. Uh, we're going to the Shorten Hotel one night in Washington, and I'm in the front seat with my ear, but this time we had radios. I had my earpiece in, and the White House called me and said, tell the Vice President that Martin Luther King's been killed. So I had to turn around the seat and tell him that. Two months later, we're, he's going to give the graduation speech at the Air Force Academy. We get there late, we're tired, we traveled all day, went to bed, three o'clock in the morning, one of the midnight agents men said, wake up the Vice President, Bobby Kennedy's been killed. Yeah, that was a tough two weeks for, or two months for me. But that type of stuff goes on, and uh, it just, uh, we live in a violent nation. What the hell can you say? It's just the way it is. Mm. Yes. We're looking at another picture here uh, in Virginia, and uh, there you are um, by the door, not the one holding the door, but the one adjacent to it there. I would have. Let's, uh, let's talk about the president again. You, you mentioned he was very personable. I understand he, he knew you by name, and he would give you Christmas presents. He was wonderful. He made a point of knowing all of our names. And like, uh, he, this is Glenora, Virginia, or Middleburg, where that church is. And they were building a, a residence down there called Glenora. And we used to get, if you, we used to get down there for 30 days. It was, it was a terrible duty because we'd live in a tent watching them build a house. But anyway, it, when you came back, he'd always say, well, I missed you. Where you been? That was the kind of a guy he was. The kids were wonderful. They were little. And uh, Jackie was kind of a shy person, but very nice. And one story I can tell you about that was we were at Glenora, and Jackie, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, loved to ride horses. And she had several horses down there. And I was there with a guy named Joe Palella from Chicago who had arms this big. And she says, Mr. Agent, which she called all of us, Mr. Agent, would you help me on the horse? He didn't know what the hell a horse was. So anyway, she puts up one foot, one in the stirrup, one foot, he went, she went, right over there. <laughs> land on her head. I said, Joe, let me do it. I, you know, I think I can do it. I'm not as strong as you are. <laughs> but uh, that's the last time she asked us to help her mount a horse. <laughs> but, but those things happen. And, you know, you got a city boy trying to do a country man's job. It just doesn't work that way. Yes. Here's uh, President Kennedy with his brother-in-law, Peter Lawford. Of, of course, Kennedy knew a number of entertainers, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Bing Crosby. You have a couple of very interesting Frank Sinatra stories that you can tell us. Frank Sinatra, we were, we were staying at, uh, I think it was the Waldorf Astoria, and he was always around, and he was on the board of directors or something, of, of Budweiser, I think the board of directors. And he saw somebody drinking, a, one of the agents, he wasn't supposed to be doing it, but he saw him drinking like a Coors beer, and he said, what are you drinking that for? He said, I like it. He said, I'll take care of that. He sent a case of beer every month to his house for a year, <laughs> a Budweiser. Got him, off, got him off that kick. And, uh, and, and he was just a wonderful guy. Another time he gave, and actually it was the same guy he bought the beer for. He gave him four tickets to a concert in New York. And this guy that he gave, he was kind of a rounder, the agent was. And so he gives him four front row tickets for nothing. And I forget who the show was, it was somebody big. And so Sinatra comes out on stage. It's not this guy sitting in those four seats. He sold them. <laughs> well, that's yeah. That's the last time we got any tickets from Sinatra. But 
anyway, but the, the, the Rat Pack was for real. They were, they were his confidants and they were his friends. And uh, they were kind of fun to watch, really, but uh, thank God I wasn't a part of them. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about you for a minute, because you're a young man uh, exposed to this remarkable moment in history, not just the president, but celebrities and world leaders. What's it like for you coming to work each day in this kind of an environment? I don't know. You can't. For the first month or so, it's, it's interesting. But then you see they're just like you are, you know. Just, uh, I, if you get too impressed with it, you forget what you're doing. And pretty soon you learn that some of the people you had a lot of re regard for aren't worth a damn. <laughs> and, and that's pretty easily seen. Uh, I, I don't think it ever changed my opinion about people. Uh, I saw a lot of very wealthy people who were, were humble people, honorable people. I saw a lot of uh, wealthy people. I had no idea how the hell they got wealthy. Uh, then I saw a lot of people who were wealthy and uh, didn't know how to handle it. They were obnoxious. Uh, but it's just no different than the rest of the world. These guys are human beings. Like, you know, Jerry Ford was kind of like, you know, he was a center on the Secret Service football team. He was just, just a nice guy. And they're human beings. And uh, I don't see, I, I, you know, I, I saw some stuff from the standpoint of lifestyle. Like, Kennedy lived at Hyannisport. He'd take us to Palm Beach at Christmas, Palm Springs. You know, pretty nice stuff as opposed to, LBJ going to Johnson City, Texas with the cattle guards. You know, <laughs> you know, we went from yachts to cattle guards like that, and uh, <laughs> you know, it wasn't real fun. But anyway. Well, the fall of 1963, um, of course, is when all of this changed. Before Dallas, before the trip to Texas, you were part of the advance team for Miami, and you had some concerns for the president's safety in Miami. Yeah. At the time, I was single, and uh, the single guys... We wanted to be on the road because it was easier to stand on post at midnight. But also here on per diems, a little extra income never hurt anybody either. But uh, I had done the advance to Miami with some other people. And it's at the time when the Bay of Pigs and all that stuff was going on, Cuban refugees, and it was really hairy. In fact, we had planned to drive Kennedy to the, the Americana Hotel. We ended up, it was so bad, we choppered him in uh, because we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, it, w it was a very difficult situation. Uh, we were hand in hand with, the Bureau was really concerned about it, the FBI was really concerned about it because uh, they had a lot of stuff on a lot of those Cuban refugees, and not all of them were, were friendly. Uh, now then from there I went directly to, to San Antonio uh, where Kennedy dedicated the Brook Army Hospital and that was the advance I did the day before he was assassinated. And that was a very simple one because it was on a military base and, you know, everyone was, uh, all the people there were military. It wasn't a difficult stop and, frankly, by that time I'd been on the road for about a month and I kind of needed the rest. So I looked forward to it. But the last, uh, when he was getting on the plane to leave San Antonio to go to Houston, where he had a luncheon or a dinner that night, then he spent the night in Fort Worth and then he came to Dallas. So I, he spoke to me, uh, thanked me for the, for the trip and so did she. 18 hours before he was killed. That was the last time I saw him. I, drove, I flew back to D.C. that night. I finally got a day off. We're looking at some silent uh, color film of that trip to San Antonio. And uh, this was the last time, you, as you said, the last time you saw President Kennedy. You mentioned Miami and the security concerns. Did you have concerns like that about the trip to Texas? Not in San Antonio. They did in, Texas, in Dallas. And I can't speak for Houston. But San Antonio was, was really an easy stop. Uh, as I say, they landed at the military base. It was all on base. There was only base personnel allowed. General public was not allowed. So uh, it, was, it was really an easy stop, and uh, we had no concerns there. So tell us about the day of the assassination. You're back in Washington. What's your day like? I was having lunch with the guy who threw Jackie over the horse. <laughs> and... Uh, it came, it came across the radio that he'd been assassinated. So right away, we both went home and got, we lived together. We both got dressed and went down right to the White House for assignment. And uh, I was sent down to uh, Glenara, the, the country place in Middleburg, to uh, pick up some stuff that she wanted to wear, the, the dress and so on, that she chose to wear for the funeral. And, uh, and on the way back, I hit a cow and went head over heels in that, but that's another story. I, saw, I must have landed in my head because I didn't get hurt. But anyway, uh, so we got the dress, dress back to her, and then that whole wedding was, uh, wedding, 
the whole funeral was planned by her. No one else helped. And all that sorrow she was going through, she planned that entire wedding, the place to bury him. Nothing, none of those preparations had been made within four days. And she was just an amazing woman. I never, I never saw her cry. Now, I'm sure she cried on her pillow at night, but in public, she never cried. She wore that veil over her face. And uh, she, she, was a, she was a tough woman. And I, I, you, know, you can't help but love her for it. The Secret Service, of course, your job is to protect the president. The president died. Ultimately, the Secret Service fails in their responsibility. Do you feel a sense of guilt? Is it a burden on you? Yes, to answer your question. But I, in a lot of ways, I wish I had been there because maybe I could have done something that nobody else did. I don't know what that would have been, and looking at the film and so on. In fact, if you recall... Clint Hill was the agent who caught the car and, and threw Mrs. Kennedy back in the car. The reason Clint got there before anybody else was he was riding on the Secret Service car, the follow-up car, next to the driver on the left-hand side because he was assigned to the First Lady. And the other guy's on the right-hand side and the guy behind him. So they heard the first shot. All of them turned right, high right. When, when Clint turned like the rest of them had, he saw Kennedy grab his neck. That's why he was able to make the car and no one else was. The other guys had looked away this way, and Clint happened to notice him grabbing his throat. Um, it's interesting on that, we brought, we, the Secret Service brought in a couple of people to reenact what Clint did. Uh, they were never able to duplicate it. They brought in a guy named Jim Ryan, who at the time was a a college miler, the first college kid to break the four-minute mile. They brought him in on the same conditions, same speed. We caught the car, and when Clint caught the car, Bill Greer, the driver, floored 600 horsepower engine, and Clint took an arm and grabbed her and threw her back, and he said she weighed 2,000 pounds from the, from the force of the car. And he didn't remember doing it. But anyway, when they brought in Jim Ryan, he was never able to catch the car, let alone climb on the back and throw 2,000 pounds in the back seat. Clint, to this day, it just, you know, just adrenaline. Uh, he, he saw the president grab his neck. He knew there was a problem. He wasn't even assigned him. He was assigned to the first lady. And he's the guy who convinced me that all the shots came from up here because he said he heard them, and they all, they've all told me the same thing, high right. But Clint said in the car, uh, it was just a gory mess that all the brain, he was between the eye here and half the back of his head was gone, left, right side. And it was all forward. He said, you could almost see an outline of the driver of Bill Greer on the windshield, you know, where he blocked all the, all the brain matter. And he said there was nothing on the left side of the, of, the, of the trunk. There was very little on the trunk at all because it all went forward. So that takes away the grassy knoll theory. Clint said at the hospital, if he'd been shot from the grassy knoll, there would have been a hole in this side of his head. There wasn't a hole in that side of his head. So anyway, the grassy knoll theory is bunk. Uh, it was Oswald, three shots, no one else. And uh, an interesting thing about how the government operates sometimes, Clint, on the way to, the, to Parkland, saw the gory mess that it was and uh, took off his jacket and put over Kennedy's head so the press couldn't get a picture of it. Well, lo and behold, when he got back to D.C., he sent his coat to the cleaners and the government failed to pay for it. He said... So he, he, he thought it was about time to retire, too. And when they wouldn't pay for the cleaning of his coat, they saved the president from being embarrassed by it. But speaking of, of Parkland, I want to introduce to you, there's a doctor I see back here named Phil Williams. Would you stand, Phil? He, he was a young uh, intern or doctor at the time when Kennedy was at Parkland Hospital. And thank you for your service, Phil. I want to move us beyond the assassination now. Uh, we're looking at President Johnson and, and Vice President Humphrey. Uh, Kennedy and, and Johnson, a study in contrast. You, you worked with both men. How was Johnson different from Kennedy in terms of personality? Mm. My mother always said, if you have nothing nice to say, say nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> they were different. Uh, Johnson was a, a large man, uh, an overbearing man. Uh, uh, crude, uh, but he he knew how to get he knew how to get things done. He was an arm twister, uh, but uh, he treated us. He didn't treat anybody very nice. 
But that's just the way he was raised. That's the way he came up. Uh, and uh, he was a powerful man. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and he, uh, he was hard to get along with. Uh, that's the best I can say. Uh, he, was, he was hard to protect because if he'd push you, he'd just, he'd just shove you out of the way. Somebody wanted to shove him back. But, you know, but, uh, but you had to, that's when you had to work on saying, I work for the office of president. You know? <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's, that's just the way it was. He, uh, but he got a lot done. He, uh, he was under different, difficult circumstances. Uh, he had to pass some of the laws that Kennedy had already introduced. Uh, I'm not sure he believed in all of them, but he, he did it. Uh, and then um, he, uh, anyway, that's enough on Johnson. Well, you, you weren't with Johnson long because uh, starting in January of, of 65, and this is Inauguration Day we're looking at, and that's you on the right-hand side with uh, Hubert Humphrey, you began to, to work with the vice president mm -hmm. on his detail. And you went to Vietnam with uh, Hubert Humphrey four times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, give us a sense of uh, being, being right there with the vice president. What was your assessment of Vietnam? Well, let me talk, let me first say, by time... Up until this day, I've been in 50 states and 70-some foreign countries. And believe me, if anyone here wants to leave the United States, you're out of your mind. There's nothing close to it. Now, Hubert Humphrey, I got assigned to as the agent in charge of his detail, as a supervisor of his detail, and he was just a wonderful, kind, gentle man. Uh, naive, I think. Uh, he used to say, I don't understand why it takes 50,000 laws to govern 10 commandments. Well, that, that's nice to say, but... There's a human element involved in some of that stuff. I think that some people break the Ten Commandments, and that's why you have laws. But he was nice. We went to Vietnam several times. Uh, it was a mess. There's no doubt about it. I saw some of the worst stuff I've ever seen there, and General Westmoreland was always with us. Uh, and like one time we went out to an outpost, and there was American GIs, and there was Arvin forces there, the, the South Koreans. And Westmoreland was telling Humphrey the story about recently at that time, about a couple nights before, the Viet Cong had attacked that Arvin stronghold. And the American forces all went to the wall to defend it, and they were all shot in the back by their friends of the South Korean, of the South of Vietnamese. So that's what they were dealing with. The minute things got hairy with the South Vietnamese military, they were, all of a sudden, they were Viet Cong. You know, we're, we're, we're with you. And it was a tough time. I don't, I, would, I don't know what number of people of American GIs we lost in Vietnam that were killed by our friends, but it's, uh, there's a lot of them. And uh, Vietnam was just a mess, a terrible mess. If you have questions for Mr. Coughlin, I already have quite a few here, but please pass them to the end of your rows and we'll collect those now. Now, when you came back from Vietnam, of course, 1968 was a tumultuous year. You were with Humphrey at the... Democratic National Convention in Chicago. We've all seen the famous uh, film of the violence there. Uh, the Civil War, excuse me, the Civil Rights Demonstrations, the anti-Vietnam War protests. How does that make your job difficult as a Secret Service agent trying to protect these men? Virtually impossible because the Chicago police were just overwhelmed by it all. There were so many people showed up in protest at that convention. And the Chicago Police Department was a good, pretty good police department. And they just couldn't handle it. Things got really out of hand. And there were some violent people there. All during my Humphrey, uh, the four years I was with Humphrey, we had, no matter where we went, there were Vietnam demonstrators, and they were nasty people, some of them. And that's why I have caps in my teeth, because I got them knocked out with those people. And to this day, if I see a ponytail, I, I just kind of, I, I kind of cringe. Anyway, uh, but some of these people had, uh, they had a just cause. They just didn't want to go to Vietnam. And... Uh, but there's a lot of people that want to go to Vietnam, and I can see, understand why, but uh, I, I can tell you an interesting joke. I pr probably shouldn't say it. I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, like Bill Clinton didn't go to Vietnam. There were 35 agents, 30-some, 30 34, assigned to Bill Clinton that had been to Vietnam, and every one of them had a higher number of draft bureau than the number that he did. They let him know it. That's why he didn't like Secret Service. But they let him know, we went and you didn't. And uh, we don't respect you for it. But that's, uh, that's part of the games that go on, too. We have quite a few questions here. We'll go through as many as we can in the time we have left. This is one that we often get asked at the museum. Uh, was the cover on the presidential limousine really bulletproof? No, not at all. No. No, it was merely for, no, it was merely for rainy days. 
was plastic. If the cover had been on the car in Dallas, do you think that would have made any difference? Well, it may have deflected it. Who knows? Because it was a, it was a good shot that, that killed him. Uh, it may have deflected, but I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Do you know of any other attempts or plans for President Kennedy's life prior to the day of the assassination? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, you, when you show up at airports, I mean, personally, I have taken guns off four or five people at the airport, at the fence line as, as he's walking the fence line. Now, most of them are people who forgot to leave the gun in the car. But the fact is that they're there. And, uh, uh, I, you know, when you look at a crowd of people, like I said, when you walk out of church, everybody's smiling. There's a guy standing there in a trench coat. Uh, they stand out pretty well, but there were there were uh, there were people. You got a lot of hate mail, a lot of hate mail, a lot of anti-Catholic mail. Uh, but uh, there, no one no one took a shot at him. But uh, we took a lot of guns away from people, and most of them were released. I think we kept a few around for some more questioning. Uh, there's a there's a theory that one of the Secret Service agents in the follow-up car may have accidentally shot President Kennedy. That gained some traction last year during the 50th. That annoys me. George Hickey was the guy. He had the AR-15. George Hickey loved President Kennedy. First of all, for him to have shot him would have had to stand up and face the car. And that doesn't show anywhere in the film. Hickey died of a broken heart because of that charge. He died a very young man. He just couldn't accept the fact that someone would think that he killed President Kennedy. And uh, no, it didn't happen at all. Uh, George Hickey, of all people, you know, uh, anyway, no, it didn't happen. There are a number of these. The vast majority uh, ask questions about conspiracy. You mentioned earlier you do believe that Oswald fired the shots from this building. Beyond that, is there a possibility of conspiracy in your mind? I mean, how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just run through a scenario that I believe and that a lot of us, be we believe. I think it was organized crime that was behind it. And Mr. Kennedy, old man Kennedy, was on the ver uh, in the early, in the 20s. He was kind of a, uh, uh, he was a bootlegger for a while and during Prohibition, and he, he ran with some slick people in the Chicago area. And keep in mind now, the Kennedy money is really in Chicago at the, at the Merchandise Mart. It's not in Massachusetts. You know, that's where it is. So anyway, and I see my FBI friend over here looking at waiting to see what I say, but this is my theory, not yours. <laughs> I think organized crime had an interest in seeing Jack wiped out. The old man Kennedy uh, wanted one of his sons to be president. The older son got killed, and I know that for a fact that he and Giancana, who ran the Italian mafia on the south side of Chicago, were good friends. I was told by people in the political spectrum that should know what they were saying, that West Virginia was not going to go for Kennedy, and that would have cost him the nomination. Giancana called a guy named John L. Lewis, who ran the coal miners union in West Virginia, and he delivered West Virginia, so he got the nomination. They go into the election. People, again, in the political arena, will tell you that probably JFK lost that election. If you recall Cook County, again, we're back to Chicago, uh, all those votes came in late, like 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was every headstone in the county. Every graveyard in the county was counted. And Nixon never, Nixon knew it, but he never fought it like Gore did, because he just didn't want to disrupt the, the, the process. So people in the political world tell me that they think Nixon won that election, but he didn't. So then, Kennedy is now president, and the people in organized crime, i.e. Giancana and others, think that they made him president. There was Marilyn Monroe fits never, I'll leave that out. Forget that, it's not worth it. The next thing is that you have the, the syndicate, the mafia, trying to get back in Havana for the gambling. Remember that, that's where they were big in Havana. So all the boat people show up, they're all ready to go, and all the American government promised them was air cover. It never came. I understand that the reason it never came was the Secretary of Defense was a guy named Robert McNamara. Before he was Secretary of Defense was the president of Ford Motor Company, and he hated organized crime, i.e. the unions. That could be strike one. Then Bobby 
Well, let me, let me go back to the Maryland thing. There was an innocence there. That, uh, let me call the Maryland thing strike one, and I'm not going to in detail it. So this was strike two on McNamara. Then Bobby, who's now the attorney general, starts trying to put Hoffa in prison. I think that was strike three. Because these people, if, if, if I'm right, and I'm not saying that I am, it's just a theory that I have, that uh, they felt they made him president, and now they're messing with him. Well, Oswald shows up. Here's a guy who had a bad uh, dishonorable discharge from Marine Corps, renounced his American citizenship, moved to Russia, married a Russian woman, had two Russian children, and appears back in Dallas, Texas. I don't know how he got back here. I've never checked with the State Department, but maybe he came back to the State Department. I find that hard to believe, but maybe he did. I don't know. Anyway, he's back in Dallas. And he's up here on a job, uh, and he's the guy who did it. Now, there's another Chicago guy in town named, uh, named uh, uh, Ruby over here at the Carousel Lounge. Those were Giancana's ladies that he was at in the, in, the, in the Carousel Lounge over here. He was a Giancana guy, Ruby was. So Ruby, I feel, was, had a job to kill Oswald when he left this building. But for whatever reason, missed him. Crowd, you know, I don't know what, what it was. But he had no choice to do but to do what he did. Now, he, he did love Kennedy, apparently, and he claims that's why he did it. But I think, I really think there was more to it than that. I can't prove it, but that's my opinion. And I'm not speaking on behalf of the Secret Service. I'm speaking on behalf of myself on that. But I think organized crime did it, and I think it's pretty clear to me. All right. We have time for one more question. Uh, I knew this was going to come up. In recent years, the Secret Service today, the Secret Service under President Obama, have uh, come under some criticism for some of their behavior on the job. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, comment on that uh, as an agent from the 60s and 70s. I'm embarrassed because you know, there's, there's a strict rule in the Secret Service. You cannot drink in travel status. And all these things that you're reading about are happening in travel status. Another thing that I feel is that when we were in, all of us had been in the military. And those guys today are like every other 28 and 35 year old, 25 to 30 year old guy you see, they feel that everybody owes them something. You know, they're not responsible for anything. They're spoiled and, you know. And I just, I don't think they have the discipline to do the job correctly. And I'm not sure about the other agencies, but I understand they're having the same problem. Uh, and, uh, I, I think it's just the difference in the clientele where they're hiring, and because that's all that's out there. And I wish they'd hire more veterans coming back from Afghanistan, and you know, they'll kick ass and take names, those guys. Well, that's what you need, and that's what you need in this thing. And you don't have to be Mr. Nice Guy, you know, make sure that the guy who started the union's your friend, because these guys are just, uh, I don't know, I, I watch, man, before we finish, I want to do one thing here. I normally don't do this. But I, I can't embarrass all my, uh, introduce all my friends here, but I do want to introduce, introduce my daughter, Kelly. <laughs> yeah. And, and of, of all the things you've heard me say today, the 50 states and 70 countries, I was married for most of that time, and this woman, the wind beneath my wings is my wife, Ann. <laughs> uh, she went through some tough times. Uh, my kids, when they were little, always thought that Christmas was December 15th or the 18th because we had to go somewhere for Christmas and I couldn't be home. So they got Santa Claus came on the 15th of December and they still think so. <laughs> but anyway, if that's it, I want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, and I'll be here if you have questions. And uh, Yeah, right over there. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and all I can say is that uh, pray every day that your president's safe because Democracy is the worst form of government except for all others, to quote Winston Churchill. <laughs> and we have to keep it going because another assassination this country doesn't need, whether you like Obama or not, he is the president of our country. You don't have to vote for him next time or you don't know, oh, he doesn't run again. He uh, can't run again. That's right. I didn't say that politically. But uh, anyway, just, just keep in mind that your country right now, I think, is... We're having a lot of problems. We're very divided. And I don't know why it is that Congress can't, because first of all, politics is a compromise. And I don't see any compromise on either side. 
you know, I'm not sure Harry Reid's not crazy. I mean, the, some of the things he says, it just doesn't make no sense to me as a head of the Senate. And, and, but anyway, he has no desire to help anyone, and, and, uh, but that's the way it is. And I just, just say a prayer for our country because I think we're, we're in trouble. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for being here.